This is Now Breakfast. The school in that area is automatically shut down. This is Today in the News on Now Breakfast. Today in the news on Now Breakfast, Jim Obaze, the special investigator appointed by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to investigate the Central Bank of Nigeria, has summoned the chairman of Titan Trust Bank TTB, Tunde Lemo, and two other state shareholders of the bank over the controversial acquisition of Union Bank of Nigeria. Obaze, in his reports to the president, says Emefele used ill-gotten wealth to establish and Titan, Bank, and Titan Trust Bank subsequently acquired Union Bank and Keystone Bank through his proxies. He has also accused Emifile of owning over 500 foreign accounts in the United States, United Kingdom, and China, in which he kept stolen funds. Now, Emifile has denied these allegations. Dr. George Ubo is the chief executive officer, Panic Alert Security Systems Limited, and a financial expert and a financial security expert. He joins us this morning to discuss how the banking sector can help stop financial crime and illicit flow of cash. Uh, good morning, sir. All right, uh, we're going to reconnect with uh, Mr. Ubo in just a moment as we bring you this conversation um, on today in the news. It has been a whirlwind few weeks as far as uh, the conversation around the former central bank governor, Mr. Godwin Emefiele is concerned. The latest reports from the special investigator indicate that there is a lot to be unearthed in this particular conversation. And our conversation this morning with Mr. George Ubo is going to look at the banking sector, specifically with a focus on stopping financial crime and the illicit flow of cash. Of course, the Central Bank of Nigeria still figures in this conversation, seen as uh, the former governor is uh, at the center of accusations around financial misappropriation and uh, the owning of a number of bank accounts that have sums of naira which have been very shocking to the ear uh, to a lot of nigerians who have heard it you're listening to now breakfast we now reconnect with mr george obo as we uh, begin the conversation around uh, the financial sector especially the banking sector beg your pardon and the issues that it is facing at the moment. This is Now Breakfast. We are your Beyond the News Station, and we've been able to reconnect with uh, Dr. George Ubo to examine the banking sector and to answer questions around what the banking sector can do to stop financial crime and the illicit flow of cash. Uh, Dr. Ubo, good morning and welcome to the conversation. Good morning. Good morning. Right. Uh, I would like to begin by asking, uh, what is your uh, view of the situation um, involving Mr. Godwin Emefiele, especially as regards to the accusations by the special investigator, uh, Mr. Jim Obaze, into the activities of the CBN under Mr. Emefiele? Well, I mean, the accusations have been there before he, before he was appointed, uh, as far back as 2019. I came out with an uh, uh, allegation of 25.6 billion U.S. dollars jamming to uh, issuance, uh, issuances of fake certificates of capital importation to MTN and MTN bankers, all uh, outfits that originated from, the, from South Africa, and juxtaposed it to what happened there because a former South African president, Zuma, was removed uh, from office and prosecuted uh, because of his uh, alleged dealings with the Guptas, and that that that, that allegation was 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 uh, was uh, called uh, the state capture inquiry. So, uh, but regarding the banks, from time immemorial, uh, banks have been the main culprits in any uh, financial transaction that... Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Be it drug dealing, be it money laundering, any kind of crime, even murder. You know, because, so that is why globally banks are giving... Uh, the threshold within which to operate. Now, when I was engaged 
in 2015 by the federal government through former EGF Malami. Same thing, I coined the phrase the banking sector mafia because one, they never cooperated. And even as we speak, when the former president asked that the uh, federal government funds should move to a treasury single account, account, they did not cooperate. Now, recently, I'm in possession of 1.4 trillion, not billion, 1.4 trillion naira transfers in naturally made to shady individuals, one of whom, uh, or one of the narrations is uh, tuned in for kitchen. And I mean, uh, you know, I, you don't need to uh, be a psychic or a cynic to understand who to, the Tunde he was referring to. Sir, but if, more if, so, though, if, more if, so, though, these, these transactions squarely indict the banks because in one of the transactions, 14, 14 uh, uh, 14.6 billion naira was transferred 21 tranches, 21 times in a day. So, uh, I, the NFIU, Nigerian Financial Intelligence Unit, that is saddled with the responsibility to flag what we call suspicious financial transactions, never flagged it because right. of the high level of people involved. Uh, the banks themselves, you are given that uh, parameter within which to operate any transaction 14 billion transfer in one day 21 times. Right. So, uh, Mr. so uh, I was going to interrupt by asking, aren't there any regulations in place that question the movement of money through the banking system? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 getting, I'm getting to that. Not only are banks themselves mandated and giving the guidelines when it talks, you know, that is when you walk into the bank, it's very clear that when you are you are not allowed to transfer a certain amount of money, uh, personal uh, has a uh, threshold, corporate has a threshold in, in, in because of the uh, uh, Money Laundering Act. So, but but the point is, up on top of that, the NFIU can, I mean, has I was a proponent of whatever the shenanigans going on with NFIU when Nigeria was facing a suspension in 2017. The NFIU has the capability, has the capacity to tap into any bank account and flag suspicious financial transactions. So even if the bank don't do it, you have an agency that is supposed to be autonomous to flag any transaction. And once that transaction is flagged, if it's terrorism related, they send it to DSS to prosecute, to investigate and prosecute. If it's if it is drug related, uh, they send it to the NDLEA. If it is purely financial uh, crime, they send it to the EFCC. You know, but but in this case, to have this agency flagging what uh, the Yahoo boys that are moving 50 million naira and uh, get, getting them arrested and locked up and the transactions involving people in the villa, you know, 14.6 billion, 21 times a day. I have the evidence. So it, 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 that, that is why I cry for this country. And I was detained one day, one day by a nationalist people, you know, because, you know, I mean, when you come out with such allegations and they're in power, the first thing they do is, 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 is use the... Uh, no enforcement to to come after you. Right. I want to so give. If, um, if, if I may, I want to give. I want. I want to give kudos to the new CDN governor, though, because the same letter I wrote to Nigeria that uh, made him to send security uh, agencies to me to arrest me. He, the new CDN governor sent me 15 kg documents. So you if, know, if when you uh, that. so so uh, the issue of Nigeria. To be honest with you, I've gotten to the point with. The evidence I have, coupled with the new special investigator, is not just a nationalist. Right, sir. You if if, if I may, you have a lot of people. You have a lot of people in that office. Right. If, if I may, know, if I may uh, apologize, we're we're looking at stopping financial crime, and we've seen the CBN Act to halt suspicious movements of money, as you've mentioned in Nigeria. So, in this particular case, where money was moved, is it a case of policy absence or policy failure? What actually went wrong 
and what needs to be fixed so that um, financial crime cannot happen in Nigeria? My, my brother, even policy, even in my own company, I tell them, you can, I'm a security expert, you can put all the security apparatus in place. Even when I install security uh, gadgets for clients, when you finish installing or installation, the human element is the problem in Nigeria. The human element. So, to be honest with you, we have very good laws, robust laws. I always say that the law enforcement agency in Nigeria is the most powerful because in U.S., where I got my, my training, any crime you commit in U.S., unless it's capital offense, you have five, seven years to prosecute. You know, you're talking a uh, statute of limitation. Nigeria is one of the few countries that they can go back 10, 20, 30 years to prosecute you for any crime you've committed. So what is the problem? Right. Yes, well, it is a human element. It is a human element because you have, for instance, the 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 twenty five point six billion dollar um, fraud I'm talking about has to do with issuances of the CBN Act is very clear. When you forge the certificate of capital importation, not it, the act even calls for it by having a new magazine now, not just the twenty five point six billion dollars, but it calls for punishment ten times of that amount. So I, I do apologize for interrupting you, but um, we have actually run out of time. I want to say thank you very much for joining us on this conversation this morning and the work that you're doing to shine the light um, on issues in Nigeria. Well, thank you. You're welcome, sir. Our guest on the conversation this morning is Mr. George Ubo, the Chief Executive Officer of, of Panic Alert Security Systems Limited and a financial security expert. He was joining us to speak on the banking sector and how the banking sector can stop financial crime and the illicit flow of cash. You're still listening to Now Breakfast on Radio Now 95.3 FM. The conversations continue. You're listening to Now Breakfast. This morning on Now Breakfast, we turn our lights towards the political scene. It's been a very busy year for political gladiators, stakeholders, players and spectators in the country. The year started with Nigeria electing a new president, a new set of governors and lawmakers. This was also followed by different tribunals, appeals and Supreme Court cases by aggrieved parties in which some of them are still pending in court. Now, the year in politics also had internal strife in different political parties, which saw some of them break up into factions or look like they're breaking up into factions. A political analyst, Mr. Gide Ojo, joins us today to review the Nigerian political scene for 2023. Uh, Mr. Ojo, good morning and thank you for joining us on the conversation. Would like Good morning. Is it possible for you to give me a quick overview of the 2023 political scene in Nigeria? Well, um, again, uh, that, that's part of what I dwelt on um, in my column in the functioning paper of this year. Um, looking at the seventh general elections and post election as well as the inauguration and governance. So this 2023 is peculiar in the sense that as a result of the seventh election in this fourth republic, we have two presidents, two sets of senators, two sets of House of Reps, two sets of state houses of assembly, members, two sets of ministers, two sets of commissioners, and a whole lot of new sheriffs in town. And if you break it down, recall that the year started with the campaigns for 2023 general election. And at that time, we had over a thousand um, matters in court as a result of the, the very messy party primaries and candidate nomination that took place last year. So we entered the year, uh, this, this particular year is unique in the sense that unlike previous elections where the campaign period in the public is 90 days, we have 150 days of campaign. 
So it's what is in the world from last year to this year. Uh, we have first set of elections on February 25. Second, so that was the national election. We talk of uh, presidential, senatorial, and House of Reps. And um, the second set of elections were state elections, that's governorship and state houses of assembly. As we know, we didn't have full complement of 20, we, we didn't have full complement of governorship elections. There were 28 uh, governorship elections up in, in, on, on March 18th. Uh, we later had three additional ones last month on November 11, making a total of 31. Out of these 31 governorship elections, four have been nullified either by court of first instance, which is the tribunal, or by the appellate court. Right. So the four cases, the four cases are the Supreme Court awaiting final resolution. Right, Mr. Well, Mr. Ojo, Mr. Ojo, I apologize yeah. for interrupting you, but to go to the Supreme Court itself. Now, we're looking at uh, the uh, com full complement of judges at the Supreme Court. Do you think that with this full complement of judges, we'll be able to hasten the conclusion of the electoral matters in Nigeria? It's not only election, um, electoral matters. The, 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 the full complement of Supreme Court will expedite both criminal and civil cases that have been pending. Let me give you a difference. Uh, let me give you an instance. I, I was on a radio program a couple of days back, and the guy said in his community, the the uh, the chieftaincy Tosu had been on for 25 years, and he's still in the court. The initial petitioners perhaps have died, and their children have inherited the case. Similarly, land matters, you know, took it. So, uh, for the first time in a very long while, I don't know when last we had full complement of Supreme Court justices. Uh, Tinuba has been able to do that. And it's expected that this will fast track uh, cases at the, at the apex court. Right. But I, I think that's just one side of the... Uh, Compliment because the constitution also specifies that there should be 100 justices at the court of appeal. I'm not sure we have more than 70 or thereabouts. So we we need the full complement of the court of uh, court of appeal justices because they are the ones that will process cases that may end up in the at uh, the Supreme Court. So. Uh, why we why we why we appreciated the fact that the uh, the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Kaya Ariwola, uh, working with the National Judicial Council and the President, and then uh, as well as the as well as the Senate, have been able to uh, uh, pull it off to a full complement full complement of Supreme Court justices. We also will plead that at the lower level. Uh, court of first instance, whether customary court, Sharia court, or high court or federal high court, as well as the as well as the court of appeal, uh, it's important to have full complement of justice. And not just that, we need them to also provide. You know, as I used to say, they must be well resourced. Right. Well so resourced in terms of uh, you know uh, bureaucracy. Funding, uh, incentives, all the paraphernalia that the office will need to function maximally should be provided. Mr. Ojo, I hear you, and uh, that is a good place to put a pause in the conversation today. I'd like to say thank you very much for joining us and speaking to us on this particular issue uh, right here on Now Breakfast. This is Now Breakfast. A very good morning to you, Lagos, Nigeria. You're still on to now breakfast. It is time for the interview. Our conversation this morning heads over to Plateau State, where the death toll from the attack of gunmen on 23 villages in Bokos and Barking Ladi local government areas of Plateau State has increased to over 100 persons. The state's governor, Governor Caleb Muftuang, has described the attack as a terrorist attack 
calling on the federal government to tackle the issue by making arrests. No group has taken responsibility for the attack. The two local governments, however, have had a history of all-time conflict between Fulanis and the indigents of the local government. Musa Ashams is the Commissioner for Information in Plateau State, and he joins us this morning on the interview to discuss the state government's efforts in tackling the security issues in the state. Um, Commissioner Ashams, good morning, and thank you for speaking with us this morning. Uh, we would like to start by expressing our condolences. It is not, uh, we understand that um, every person in Plateau State, whether a private citizen or indeed every Nigerian, will be sad to hear of the loss of more Nigerian lives. We uh, extend our condolences to you, and we do hope that uh, we will find the fortitude to bear through this loss together. Thank you very much, Radio Now. Thank you for having me on the interviewer. The mood on the Plateau is a sad one. You know, Christmas is one of the is the biggest celebration on the plateau. But um dear devil, ragtag army have come to spoil the mood, the ambience. But we give God all the glory. And um we are not done with counting our losses because a lot of um, young people, elderly women, children were machetted by these um, assailants, by these terrorists. Like I said, right. the mood on the plateau. Mm. Well, to go into it, what was the response time by the security um, agencies that are available in Plateau State when this attack happened? You know, the, the, the reality of the situation is that these people took out this um, pogrom with military precision because they attacked 23 villages almost at the same time. So sometimes it becomes overwhelming for the military because you, you begin to wonder what kind of um, attack is this that people will just come at the same point and time and hour begin to attack and kill innocent lives. You know, our people are peaceful people. Our people love um, peaceful environment, an ambience that is peaceful. We're very, very industrious. Our weather is very, very clement. We're very, very hospitable. We do not kill for any reason. And um, unfortunately, this um, terrorist, this um, genocide pattern um, into our villages and um, killed people and took over and, and even destroyed homes. Those that escaped saw them touching their houses. So it's, it's a pathetic situation. The military, if not the number, would have been more than this. Right. Well, is, is it possible to give us a timeline of the military response? Because, as you have said, they attacked uh, villages simultaneously. And uh, we spoke with a journalist in uh, Plateau State yesterday. He indicated that there's actually a military presence in the two local governments where these attacks happen. That's uh, Bokos and Birkin Ladi. Is, can you confirm that the military was present or that they have a base in these local governments? If it, if it is about having base, because these are local governments that get... Um, attacked from time to time. If it is about having base, we have military bases in these places. But the issue is that um, our people got killed. Our people cannot remember the number of hours it took before military came or minutes. Our people will want to have a peaceful atmosphere. Our people will want to live and let live. Our people will not go out there to take anybody's life. The major challenge now is for us to stop it before it even um, kick starts. It's not about saying, okay, we only had three casualties before they came in. It is three minutes before they came in. You know, this is an intelligence-driven um, job. Once you have intelligence, you can you can need this um, behavior in the boat. You can curb it. You can um, curtail the excesses. It is quite unfortunate. If you hear me stammering, it's because the, the, the situation is pathetic. It is satanic. It is ungodly. It is unpatriotic, it is inhumanity. And you begin to ask, when these people sit down to strategize on how to right. kill, didn't all they also sit down to strategize on how to improve on their economic life? Didn't they also sit down to strategize on how to have a um, peaceful and coexistence as if they are Nigerians? Shouldn't they also think of how to improve the education, to improve the children, education and the economy and welfare of their families? And the economy and welfare of their families? Is it only when is it, it only when they to do that they sit down to that sit down? So it is it's not about intervention for us. It is about stopping it at the issue. It is about us living in our communities without fear, 
without being molested, without being killed. Right. I, I hear you, Commissioner. I, I do have to ask. It's not the first time um, that these local government areas have made the news because of these sort of situations, because of attacks and loss of lives. Uh, I believe some eight months ago, uh, there was another report that uh, indicated that there was uh, an attack happening in Mangu, Birkin, Ladi, uh, Riom, just south and Boko's local government area of the state. And in this particular case, uh, mm. the Mieti Allah Cattle Breeders Association accused the native population of these local governments of murdering innocent uh, Fulani teenagers who were working on their father's farm at uh, Donkasa village of Basa local government area. Um, and if we look a little, if we look further back as, as early as um, 1994, 1991, 1995, we have seen conflicts. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 1995, there was a conflict between the Mangu and the Bokos border communities. It started in 1992. It became a full-blown uh, incident in 1995. And the uh, bone of contention in this case was a boundary dispute. So it does seem that um, there's been an ongoing unrest, if you would pardon the term, in this particular area. What has the state government been doing to ensure that the Fulanese and the indigenous community uh, live in peace? Okay, right. Like you, you rightly spoke about boundary disputes. If you go to Ife and Modakeke, we had it, Aguleri and Umuleri, between Binui and the Boeing State, um, Cross River and the Boeing State. This kind of issues come. Once you have people, you see that they have interest. And once the interests collude or collide or they cross each other, you will have conflicts, but not the one that you take people's lives, not the one that you just come at the break of dawn or at the dawn of the night and you begin to shoot sporadically, you begin to burn people's homes, you begin to take over their lands. That's not the issue. So if you say there had been, you gave a trajectory, a history. When when you talk about Mangu Bokos, nobody killed anybody. It is just conflict of boundary issues. And our people cannot kill because of land because God has given our forefathers the certificate of occupancy free of charge. It is unlike the Aguleri Umuleri, the Ife Modakeke crisis. So when you reel out the trajectory, the history of how it happened, but well, this is 2023, sir. Should we continue on the same lane that our predecessors, that our forefathers went took? I think that is erroneous. If there are issues, they should be brought to the table for discussion. But there are no issues. We just wake up and people are killed. We just wake up and lands have been taken. We just wake up and houses have been touched. So you do not know what your assailants want. They do, those we've lived with can testify, can attest to the fact that we are peace-loving people, that we are hospitable. That is little wonder why you go to our hinterlands and you find people that do not belong to the ethnic group of that um, land living there peacefully. But once a handshake is beginning to get to the elbow, to the shoulder, then you need to call for caution. We do right. not, we are not aggressors. We are not very, very aggressive. We are peace loving people. We know that there's dignity in labor. So even if we do not have money, even if we do not have resources, we are content. Ask people, make your journalists come to Plateau State and do a PA, an interview, and do a research about how we are, about who we are. We're peace-loving people. We cannot take people's lives because of um, worldly things. We know that very soon we'll go and leave them here. Our forefathers were here before us. They left and we're here now. Very soon they will call us forefathers too. So we're not the people who right. give violence. We're not the people who, who, who are not uh, hospitable. We are commodities. Commissioner, commodities. I, I hear you. And I can personally attest to the hospitable nature of the Plateau people because I've been in uh, Jos several times. I've, I have friends from mm -hmm. Jos. It is a peaceful people. There are people, warm, welcoming people. Uh, but the question is as regards whether uh, this is a case of a dispute between people who are resident in this community or it's a case of um, the community as a whole, both the indigents and um, can I call them those who come to reside in the community being attacked by a separate group that is not resident in the communities. There's, there's no dispute anywhere, my brother. There's no dispute. We're not we're not um, fighting over. It's just a case of terrorism. It's just a case of annihilation. It's just a case of um, trying to wipe people from the face of the land. 
is ethnic cleansing. Nobody is disputing over anything. Like I told you, the, the sea of O of these lands were given to us by God Almighty. We didn't kill anybody before taking over. We're not disputing over anything. Our people are peace loving. If you ask for certain things, we've given lands for free. We've accommodated people in this um, plateau state. Well, people have accommodated us too on, in other states. We have a diaspora community. You know, we know that we cannot live here alone. Right. Mr. Commissioner, I, I do apologize for interrupting you once again, but you refer to this as an ethnic cleansing. Yes. Right. So who are the actors here? Because if it's, a, if it's targeted at a specific ethnic group, that's information that I believe all of Nigeria would like to be made aware of. Yesterday, I went on an interview um, spam sessions and I asked the people, they said they were saying the people that came to kill them were chanting Allah Akbar and they saw some of them and they ran away and they touched their houses. Right. Um, Mr. Commissioner, one other uh, statement that has been made um, is that that has been made by the governor, Mr. Kileb uh, Mutfuang. He's criticized what he described as a lack of political will by the federal government uh, to flush out the Marudin terrorists on, uh, on the plateau. He says that the insurgents have actually been occupying schools in Barking Ladi local government area of the state for about five years without being dislodged. Can you shed more light on this? Because if we have uh, hostile actors within a community for a period of time, then it moves the conversation beyond a random attack to something that is a concerted and long-term effort to uh, harm Nigerians who are resident in this community. This is Now Breakfast.